Some games can get away with a loner player character, a strong and independent protagonist playing by their own rules who don't need nobody. Not every game though. Most game protagonists need someone else around to show them the ropes. Someone to bounce ideas off of. Someone to help them up when they're knocked down. A sidekick. Sidekicks can fill a lot of different roles in a game, but they all live somewhere on a spectrum, from a well-realized indispensable three-dimensional character to a cardboard cutout, a barely disguised plot delivery device. You probably want to move away from the cardboard cutout side, but that's gonna take some work. Let's talk about what goes into a good sidekick. It's easy to fall into a rut and make the same stuff for dinner over and over. I've done that, but lately I've gotten way more variety in my life thanks to today's sponsor, HelloFresh. HelloFresh delivers pre-portioned, chef-crafted meals to your door and has over 40 to select from each week. Check this out. I never cooked with candied peanuts before, but now I have. If you're short on time, they've got quick and easy dinner options designed to take just 15 minutes to make. That is faster than going to the supermarket after all. HelloFresh also now has snacks too, and sides. Check that out. That's me. I did that. And it was really good. Shop the HelloFresh market and get over 100 different add-on items shipped at the same time. Try it out. There's never been a better time. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code 50DesignDoc at checkout for 50% off plus free shipping. The link's in the description below too. HelloFresh.com and use code 50DesignDoc. Thanks, HelloFresh. Game sidekicks can fill a ridiculous number of shoes. A sidekick can be a companion, a teacher, a spokesman, a diegetic tutorial, a living utility knife, a compendium, or an instant plot starter. But with so many roles they could fill, sidekicks are sometimes saddled with responsibilities by default and when they don't live up to expectations, it's very easy for an audience to dislike a sidekick. You've seen a lot of this, I'm sure. Lots of companions are thought to be nags, pestering nuisances, backseat drivers, helpless boat anchors, or unintentional obstacles, all breaking your immersion and taking you out of the fun in one way or another. Sidekicks require a careful touch to keep out of the contempt zone, and what to watch out for will depend on what exactly you want one to do. Probably the most common use of a sidekick is as a way to give information to the player in-universe. No data logs and text boxes, just your friend telling you what's up. The Zelda fairies in the two N64 games are the classic vanilla examples, for better and worse. Navi and Ocarina of Time and Tattle and Majora's Mask are primarily there to guide the player in various ways. That can be contextualizing the world, giving objectives, lending hits on how to get past enemies or puzzles, highlighting points of interest, and especially providing tutorials for new game concepts like Z-targeting. They do their jobs well, though they're especially notorious for how overbearing they can be. Navi is infamous for chiming in every 20 seconds about something, even things you've dealt with before. Tattle reigned it in to be less intrusive. She doesn't pop up as often, and instead of yelling out annoying voice lines, she gets your attention with a little bell chime that doesn't hit a nerve nearly as much. Most of the later Zelda companions kept driving in a less intrusive direction and got more utility added on top, but that all went away with Skyward Sword. Fi is Navi EX Ultra Savage. Everything people didn't like about Navi is ramped up with Fi. The original release of Skyward Sword is extremely handholdy, with Fi interrupting the action all the time to give obvious gameplay tips and restate mission objectives and info the player just heard or saw. Fi is explicitly written as a cold and calculating robot, which leaves little else to save her character. It's tough to know when a psychic should chime in, but that doesn't mean that the answer is chime in all the time. The interruptions destroy the pace of the game for no benefit. The HD re-release drastically toned down Fi's hints and made most of them optional, where the player could call on her when they wanted the info, which by itself fixes most of the problem and made Skyward Sword, if not great, at least much less of a chore to play. You might think the fix is to crank down how helpful your sidekick is. If people don't like a backseat driver, just do the opposite, right? Be careful what you wish for. It can be just as frustrating to have a borderline useless companion character. Someone who has basically nothing to say when you directly ask them for help. Paper Mario Sticker Star has many problems, and... Oh wait, I've gotta do something first. Okay, 
Sticker Star has Kirsty, a magical sticker fairy who needs you to collect a bunch of sticker MacGuffins from Bowser. She's got some light sticker power gimmicks, but she's mostly there as a hint system, which this game definitely needs. Sticker Star isn't that different from an old school Sierra style point and click adventure game with a lot of unintuitive, hyper specific puzzle solutions. It's easy to get stuck. Thank God Kirsty's here to get us back on track. Hit me up with that sweet, sweet advice, Kirsty. Oh, come on. Kirsty doesn't consistently work as a hint system. Often when you call on her, she'll say some fluff about the area, or she'll say the thing you need is somewhere. Thanks, Kirsty. No consistency is about as useful as no hint system at all. She might be more specific, or might tell you where you can find what you need, but only if you've had the item you need already. Otherwise, you get nothing. Sometimes it's the opposite for some reason. If you had the right piece of the puzzle in the past, but don't have it now, she won't give you any real hint as to what you might have needed. Good luck. Hint systems can be a great responsibility for a psychic to take care of, but if that's the mechanism to get out of a jam, you really should make sure they can deliver in your hour of need. Stretch the idea a little further, and you can get a psychic that's basically a living piece of the user interface. 808 in Hi-Fi Rush is a living metronome, well, along with the rest of the world, and can help you stay on and get back to the beat to perform more effective attacks and defensive maneuvers. Sparks in the Spyro series represents your health, can pick up nearby collectibles, and even points you in the direction of where to get more. In Phantom Hourglass, this Zelda fairy is the literal cursor you control on the touchscreen and Link will blindly follow wherever it goes. It might seem weird for a character to stand in for pieces of an interface, but they're both supposed to work to guide you to what you need to do. The overlapping responsibility makes it a surprisingly natural fit. We can go beyond a guidebook and UI though. Sidekicks can be the source of a lot of the player's core abilities. A central gameplay mechanic might be tied directly to what the partner can do or can provide. Mario Sunshine has Flood a robotic water pack that can spray water for attacking enemies, cleaning goop, or for moving around the world. The water mechanics were the big new thing added to separate the game from Mario 64, and what better way to teach you how to do them than to have your partner just tell you. Mario Odyssey's hat mechanic is its main draw, so slap some googly eyes on your cap, give it some dialogue, and now you've got a partner. Cappy gives you tons of more movement and attack options. You can throw it forward, use it as a stepping stone to jump off of, and most importantly, possess the mind of whoever you see. It acts as a typical guide too, giving out hints and showing you points of interest as you travel through the world. It feels a little like visiting all of these places with a friend, but sometimes you don't know what you're missing until it's gone. Both Cappy and Flood are briefly taken away from you over the course of the game, and not having them is immediately felt. The movement mechanics they're responsible for are fundamental to most of the puzzles and challenges the game throws at you, and without those mid-air movement options, you're stuck with just your core Mario platforming abilities. It gets a lot tougher to move around, especially in Mario Sunshine's case. The relief you feel when you get Flood and Cappy back is real, and it's on a deeper level than just missing them being around. Now, don't count on Cappy being in the future Mario platformers. Flood never came back either. But as a way to center the unique mechanics of a new game, you could do a lot worse than a one-off companion. But why stop at just one mechanic? What if your sidekick is a living Swiss army knife? Banjo-Kazooie and its sequel let you unlock a ton of moves as the bear and bird duo. But even though you're moving around primarily as Banjo, it's really Kazooie that's doing the heavy lifting. The vast majority of the moves that you learn across both games are the bird's responsibility. She does it all. She pecks. Attacks, swims, glides, springs, runs, flies, shoots eggs, drills, puts on sick Jordans, and is a gun. Banjo's just got like a roll and a backpack. Their odd couple dynamic gives the writers something to work with, but the imbalance in what each of the two is responsible for mechanically can raise some questions, where one character is clearly contributing more on this adventure than the other. It's not brought up much within Banjo-Kazooie, but spiritual successor Ukulele balances the responsibilities a little more evenly, and that can help solidify the pair as being two parts of a greater whole. Psychics can also help other characters' personalities shine through, just from how the psychic contrasts with others. As a character, Jack in the original Jack and Daxter is barely anything. He plays the straight man without saying much at all. 
a classic silent protagonist. His partner Daxter is a wisecracking Looney Tune. But since Jack isn't going to pipe up here, Daxter is left to do more of the story's legwork than he could honestly handle. It's a little easier though when your companion has another personality to play off of. Daxter has to rely on the game's other NPCs to do that job. He'll snark his way through a plot conversation to help move things along while Jack mostly just stands there. A shoulder shrug here and there is most of what you get, but it's not much to build a character off of. Daxter becomes a bit overbearing as a comic relief sidekick with no one to consistently play off of, and Jack ends up being completely forgettable as a protagonist. The duo needed an overhaul. As the series went on and drastically changed in tone, Naughty Dog felt that Jack needed his own personality, and like, dialogue. In Jack 2, Jack became a more grounded and serious character for Daxter to bounce off of, and now he could bring moments of levity to a tonally darker game. Both of them became stronger characters thanks to that contrast. The banter becomes more real, as the characters can rib on each other and Jack can properly act as the straight man to Daxter's antics rather than just standing around. The game lampshades the change in Jack's personality too, so the writers knew exactly what they were trying to fix. The new ability for the two to play off of one another helps sell the audience on their friendship and lets Daxter be more of an actual sidekick rather than an overburdened character. Sidekicks don't have to be passive helpers though. They can be there for the adventure just as much as you are. The story happening to you is happening to them too after all, and you're going to work this thing out together. The Ace Attorney series is full of sidekicks. Your assistant helps you investigate crime scenes, nudges you in the right direction during cross-examinations, serves as a comedic foil, acts as a handy plot device, and forges a close bond over the game with Phoenix or Ryanosuke or whoever the star attorney is in that game. But Capcom does love to raise the stakes by accusing them of murder in, oh, roughly every other game. It's an instant motivator. Raising the stakes of the case now that you have a personal connection to seeing justice be done. By the end of the game, the two feel like they've been on a journey together and come out of the experience as better people and not convicted felons. Sidekicks that work as story wingmen can make delivering the plot feel a lot more natural and less gamey if that's what you're going for. Lots of game conversations have a side purpose. They're there to let you, the person on the couch moving the sticks around, eavesdrop and learn important details about what's going on. You don't live in this world. You don't know what these characters should logically know, but you'll need to learn about it somehow. If you're jumping into Horizon Forbidden West, the main character Aloy is written and portrayed as a living person, with a history, preferences, all kinds of things. But a lot of the time, there's no sidekick around. It's just Aloy in the wilderness. Horizon Forbidden West made kind of a weird choice, where Aloy will just mumble to herself some gameplay hints and objective reminders. It's sort of like an internal monologue, but out loud. In isolation, it comes across as strange behavior, when you'd think a character would just think the hint rather than say it out loud to no one. What I'm saying is, Aloy needed a robot cat to talk to. Or a child. God of War 4's story is the relationship between Kratos and his son Atreus and explores their relationship as they travel to deliver the ashes of Atreus' mother to the highest peak of the Nine Realms. The father-son dynamic is always at the forefront, starting off extremely strained and becoming closer as they travel together. Kratos is cold and distant at first, and Atreus is just trying hard to process all the things he's experiencing for the first time throughout the journey. Seeing the two slowly develop a better understanding of each other is what the game's story is mostly about, and is the game's greatest strength. Kratos teaches Atreus how to survive in the world, and Atreus helps Kratos learn how to open up a little more along the way. That character development is even baked into the gameplay. You as Kratos get to observe Atreus as he becomes more confident. As a sidekick, Atreus gets more powerful and useful over time to help you deal with enemies. He'll help you translate Norse writing and give you bits of lore he's learned. You also have to deal with Atreus' fits of anger, overconfidence, and defiance, where he feels not just like a CPU-controlled puppet, but an actual person with a will of his own. Atreus as a sidekick shows off what you can do when you fully commit to treating your sidekicks as real characters, tying together what that should mean for the gameplay and the narrative, and shows off what it can look like for a character to progress alongside you as you both make a life-changing journey together. But sidekicks don't have to be stuck being the second banana. They can be the actual true protagonist after all. If a game's player character is a fish out of water, or especially if they're more of a silent protagonist, the companion might be way more important to the story than you are. 
If nothing else, their story arc might be way more fleshed out. Midna is way more important of a character in Twilight Princess than Link is. You might have the destiny, but Midna's got the story beats. She's a ruler, overthrown by Xant and cursed into this horrifying impish form that no one could possibly love. Turn on Safe Search. She's desperate to find a way to restore herself and plot revenge by any means necessary to those who have wronged her. You've got to save Hyrule again from... Whoever it is threatening Hyrule this month. Oh hey, it's that guy Midna doesn't like. That's convenient. Midna's character arc carries Twilight Princess. She starts as selfish and ruthless, in single-minded pursuit of her goals in a world that has wronged her. She's not responsible for Xan coming to power, oh no. She's owed one kingdom, and Link is just the tool for the job, a handy means to an end. Link, can you trust her? Well, what are your other options? About a third of the way through, Xant nearly takes Midna out, a sacrifice is made to save her life, the Zelda's prison box gets checked, and Midna has a change of heart, reflecting on the damage that Xant has done, and gaining a sense of duty to see this thing through for the sake of everyone else. It's not the most complicated story arc, but it's effective and endearing. Her warming up to you over the hours doesn't make her any less fun of a character either. By the time you get the face off against Xant for real, she doesn't pull any punches. Plus, as a partner, she's helpful, providing decent but not overbearing hints, quality of life hooks like teleporting you and objects around, as well as giving a fun team-up attack to help build a stronger bond between the two of you. In a series not well known at the time for deep character arcs, Binda gave a way for Nintendo to open a new door for Zelda characterization without imposing too much change onto Link himself, just in case it didn't work out. Turns out, it did. Psychics don't have to be limited to being a protagonist. The main villain can be your buddy too. That sounds fun, right? Like in Portal 2, we've got Wheatley and GLaDOS. The star of the game is retreading a lot of the first one, as you work through GLaDOS's test chambers while she jabs at you from the other room. Initiating surprise in 3, 2, 1. I made it all up. Surprise. The writing in this one is real good. Wheatley pops in from time to time in the background as the more helpful side of the robot coin, or at least as helpful as Wheatley is capable of being. Once we hit the halfway point, everything takes a turn. Wheatley and GLaDOS change places, and Wheatley cannot handle one ounce of actual responsibility. You're now stuck in the long abandoned parts of Aperture, where you find GLaDOS stuck to a potato. With Wheatley drunk on power and with no other options, GLaDOS does a bit of a face turn and becomes your companion. It turns into a perfect time to, of all things, humanize her, get a lot more backstory, and it's just really, really funny. Both Wheatley and GLaDOS don't contribute all that much to the gameplay of Portal, that's still mostly just physics puzzles in new and exciting locations, but they're both instrumental in the game's story and are the core of life and charm that the game relies on. Get your commenting gloves ready. Let's talk about unusual companion characters, secret betrayals, complete useless boat anchors, NPCs that stand right where you want to be, the best and worst companion characters you can think of. Games with sidekicks almost always task them to do some heavy lifting, either in conveying the story, tutorializing mechanics, characterization, or even just as a central focus. But the most memorable companions are designed carefully, and they can shoulder the load. 